Hi there, everyone, and welcome to lecture five. Today, we're going to be doing uh, three things. We're going to be looking at causal analysis, and uh, the reason for that is that it, it's a it's it's an interesting way of putting a paper together if you're not used to doing arguments. And so I think you'll see what I mean by that. By the time we get to lecture seven, then we will, I'll show you the argument. Like I'll, I'll show you how to put one together and everything else for the final take home. But I thought I would add this today just to give you an, another way of, of, of looking at how certain, certain uh, writing assignments can work. So as I said, it's gonna be, you might know it as cause effect, right? But it's usually called causal analysis. So we'll start with that, it won't take very long. But I'm going to try and give you some key points in terms of what type of topics you might choose for your final take home if you, if you were to use this method. All right. So it's as I said, it's only one method of many. Remember, I talked a bit about comparative uh, analysis. Remember, comparison and contrast. Remember, I said uh, it'll be I think week 11 where I'll give you the lecture on that. But then I said, but don't do that, especially for our course. Uh, but I uh, but I'm going to offer it to you just so you have it, you know, for another class. So I thought I'd do the same with causal analysis, and that's why we're doing that now, all right? Then we'll do a tiny bit on comma splices, and that's just a style thing. Well, if you remember back to lecture three, remember uh, it, with the grammar and everything else. So we'll do a tiny bit on comma, spl comma splices, and then finally we'll talk about your midterm. So I'll lay out the template for you for the midterm. It'll be very straightforward, very similar to your first major assignment on summary, right? Except there's two other elements that we'll be talking about as well. Okay, are we good? So here we go. Lecture on cause, effect, or causal analysis. Oh, and um, the worst joke of the term is coming up today, okay? Not not the one I've been making all along. Uh, we've got a new one, but and it's terrible. Terrible, all right? Anyway, wonderfully bad. <laughs> all right. So the example I usually give in class is, if you take a look at your notes here, up until around 500 years ago, it was accepted that human beings observed the sky, um, watched the sun come up and go down, Okay, right. Follow what I'm doing there. The sun come up. We still we still use terminology like sunrise and sunset, right? Even though the sun doesn't move. Okay, so it's just funny how that 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 language is still in our uh, our, our vocabularies, our nomenclature. So, so and we talked about the idea of the sun's journey around the earth, right? That's that's the way human beings thought that the the universe worked. All right. Then someone named Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus, right? Not Galileo, who's, 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 who's basically given credit for every invention ever created, all right? It was actually a guy named Nicholas Copernicus, who was a Polish astronomer, and he began to wonder about the validity of an Earth-centered universe. So, in, in other words, he's starting to look at now cause, okay? Uh, cause, effect, etc. And by the way, challenging the, 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 the causal aspect of the universe would have huge effects on, on, on daily life from, from here on in. Okay, or from then on in. And so Copernicus theorized that it was we who were going around the sun and not the other way around. Worst joke of the term, the effects of the Coper Copernican theory were astronomical. <laughs> no, astronomy, no, large. Okay, anyway, all right. So basically then, the relationship between, or the realization, I should say, okay, uh, between the connection of cause and effect would have huge implications, right? For, well, obviously religion, science. It's really interesting. If you go back and look at religion and science, the rise of science, et cetera, uh, as we know it today. If you go back and look at art, art is really interesting because up until a certain point, uh, most, this is especially true in the West, that many subjects in, in art would have been religious, right? Religious stories or what have you. And then, then uh, one artist who I love, I, I just think he's really interesting, a guy named Caravaggio comes along and he starts doing pictures about people like cheating at cards and things like that. It, it has nothing to do with what we've been seeing before, right? Not landscapes, not portraits, not religion. Those, those were the major things before. So anyway, so uh, someone like Caravaggio comes along and uh, yeah, he starts painting these other like, everyday scenes or what have you. So that's another consequence we have then when it comes to the Copernican theory. So that, anyway, I just thought that, that was interesting. Now, when we do a causal analysis, okay, this is very important. This might be the most important aspect that, that I, I can tell you for this course. If you choose to do a causal analysis, you don't have to, right? As I said, we'll get to the argument as well. But if you choose to do this, then you, you want to concentrate on either the reasons for something happening, okay, or 
the effects out of something happening. Okay, so the reasons for or consequences against. That's crucial, right? Choosing the right subject matter is crucial for doing well if you do a causal analysis. And so basically then in a causal analysis, the writer attempts to analyze the reasons that's, that led to something such as an event or decision. Now I'm going to do number two. So that was number one. Or attempts to analyze the same event or decision, okay, and its possible consequences. So right away, okay. Oh, actually, let me just finish number three. So sometimes you, you can do both, but don't do that. Don't do that. It, for the purposes of our essay, for the final research take home, if you choose to do a causal analysis based on what I'm showing you here, you'll, you'll use other things as well. You'll still bring in argumentation. But as I said, this some, some students just, they, they find this is helpful, okay? Uh, and you can throw this out. If, if this doesn't speak to you at all, don't worry about it. But the key is understanding your topic, choosing the right topic. So an event or a decision. So let me go back to the example I, I give in class all the time. For my causal analysis, now pay attention to what I'm doing here. For my causal analysis, I want to do feminism. No, no, that's not going to work. Feminism didn't is not an event or a decision. It didn't just happen, right? On the other hand, let's say I'm interested in feminism. Okay, well, maybe I could do, why did women get the vote in Canada? Okay. Now, you can go back and look. It starts in Manitoba. I'm sure many of you are aware of that, right? The famous five, et cetera. Emily Murphy, Nellie McClung. But, but the, the key is, rather than doing a broad topic, you have to find something that actually happened. And that way, you can work up to the reason why it happened or the consequences of it happening, okay? One or the other, right? So try, try to find the right topic if you're doing a causal analysis. It is so crucial for understanding the right topic will get you a better grade. So again, feminism, no, no. But an aspect, like something something specific that happened, yes, of course you can do that. That's the difference, okay? So be, be clear on that, right? Make a note of that. And so, and as I said, so if you, if you choose to do this, don't do both. Don't do both the causes and the effects, okay? Or, or the reasons for and the consequences of, do one or the other. Almost invariably, I find it's always better to do the causes leading up to something. Right, it, it, it's more tangible. Okay, um, that's not not one hundred percent, but I just find usually it's it, it's easier to do the causes that led up to something rather than the effects. And if you do choose to do the effects, just just you know, for instance, don't do something too recent. Like you can't do something that that happened like six months ago because th there hasn't been enough time. There won't there won't be scholarly material out there. All right. So you want to find something and, and don't do something like the invention of the smartphone. God, I hate I hate topics like that. I, I, only because I've read thousands and thousands of papers on that. All right. I'll, I'll give you some ideas in just a second. OK. All right. So basically, then, if you're taking a look at the bottom of page one in your notes, causal analysis answers one of two questions, sometimes both. But in our case, one, what are the causes of S where S simply means the subject, whatever subject you choose, or what are the effects of S? where S signifies, again, the event or the decision. That's it. That's it. So, so as I said, even though you'll still have other things that I'll be talking about in Lecture 7, right? You'll, you'll still bring in many of the things I'll be talking about in Lecture 7. Some people like this, I, this as a starting point. It, for some reason, it, it, it makes it more manageable, okay? But as I said, you don't have to follow this, right? Because I'll give you plenty for argument in Lecture 7 as well. So there you go. That's, that's page one. So then to write, a, well, I, I, in the notes it says, to write a, 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 an effective ca a causal analysis, right? To write anything effectively, these rules apply. So I'll do them quickly. You've got the notes. Be honest and objective in your investigation. Far too often, first year papers, you've got your mind made up before you've done any research. And so in we talk about that quite a bit in class. It, it, many of us have opinions on things we've never really studied. And that's just the way human beings are, right? You've got strong opinions on things, but you never actually looked them up or researched them, what have you. It, it, the examples I could give, it would get me into trouble, but there's so many examples I could give you where people have these assumptions about certain things, but they've never really looked into them. They've never really investigated. I mean, if you think about it, where does most of our knowledge come from? 
well, for the most part, it comes from our environment, our family. Okay, it, it like, like we do not spend a lot of time sitting in a library when we are in, you know, kindergarten to grade grade twelve. We just don't. <laughs> All right, at least I didn't. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> be honest and objective in your opinion. Now, notice what I have there in parentheses. What does the research information say? Don't make up your mind too. Uh, how many times have I told you that? Don't make up your mind too early. Remember, it's exactly the same thing with an introduction. Don't create it too early. Wait, find out, and then let those things kind of sort themselves out rather than forcing everything into it. And there you go. Then uh, analyze complex ideas in order to distinguish between the remote and the immediate. I can give you an example for that. Um, and so in, in high school, you were probably taught something like the First World War was caused because of the assassination of some guy who you've never heard before, right? Archduke Ferdinand, okay? Well, it was probably a heck of a lot more complicated than that, right? Right? You see what I mean? And that's where you can have fun with this as well. Maybe you find a topic where many people have simply took, uh, uh, taken for granted that certain things led to you know, a certain event or decision. And in fact, when you do the research, you find, no, it, it was very different from what a lot of people think. That's always fun to do. Uh, and I, sometimes I give examples on that, but I'll, I'll let you play around with that, like think about that yourself. Finally then, not finally, but uh, don't be swayed by your own initial biases and prejudices, especially if you're just out of high school, right? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous lectures, but when I came to university, I knew everything, everything. <laughs> and now I realize how little I know, all right? So be careful of stuff like that as well. We have all these opinions, but have we actually worked them through? Have we actually researched them, okay? And, oh man, there are so many things I could talk about, especially when it does come to prejudice. That's a huge one. Uh, I, I'm gonna stay general on that, but uh, yeah, my goodness, Hun hundreds of things going on in the world right now. People who have opinions about things, they've never ever even thought about them right? They simply have opinions, right? There's no substantiation. They can't back up those opinions, right? But certainly they have strong opinions, okay? So, and you, you guys know what I'm talking about. So here's one of my favorites. Um, whenever there seems to be like a strike and it comes to, say, what some people would argue is an essential service, my the example I, I love to give here in Ottawa would be OC Transpo, if ever OC Transpo drivers go on strike. And it's amazing how newspapers will immediately take the side of management, almost always, almost invariably, all right? And and please don't email me about the left-wing media. There is no such thing as left-wing. There, there's, 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 there's no such thing as left-wing media as, as, as that term would actually apply. I shouldn't say there's no such thing, but, but it's not easy to find a lot of left-wing leaning uh, ideas out there. Right. Anything you see on TV or in the newspapers, that's not left wing at all. OK, that's a term. Again, there's another good example that that's a term that is thrown around a lot by U.S. media, especially like Fox News and things like that. Right. Left wing media, left wing media. <laughs> My God. Anyway. All right. Sorry. Sorry. Daddy will get off his high horse now. All right. So. Um, but yeah, but don't over, what I'm saying is don't oversimplify. So quite often you'll see something like. Um, yeah, the reason for a, a given worker's strike is greed and laziness or what have you. And, you know, that, that's, when you start to work through these complex issues, right, it's far, far much more involved. And here's another perfect one. Be very careful of this. All right. Do not write. Do not make this type of assumption on your final paper or take home. OK, the reason for violence is in society is caused by all the violence on television. No, you. that is simply not true. Can I prove that it's not true? Was there violence in societies before the invention of television? Uh, yeah, I think there... Okay, okay. So that's what I mean by don't oversimplify. Okay? Then, going back to the Archduke Ferdinand, be aware that an event can be triggered by a complex okay, variety of things. Okay? So, so again, then that kind of goes back to simplification as well. And so, yeah, the one last one, I, I, again, I like to play around with this in class, but don't mistake coincidence for causation. And if you just want to have a bit of fun, go online. Uh, once you have watched this incredibly important lecture. <laughs> and uh, take a look at 
um, the connection between the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. All right. I, I'm not going to get into it, but if you want to ha just have some fun, right, there's a whole whole lot of conspiracy theories and whatever out there. And then you have all these coincidences. Right. Um, well, I'll give you a quick one that Abraham Lincoln. Right. He he was in Ford Theater. OK, Ford is also an automobile. Right. And um, Kennedy was in a Lincoln. Who cares? <laughs> anyway, so if you if you want to have fun with stuff like that, if you, if you have nothing to do today, just go type in, you know, conspiracy theories, Lincoln and Kennedy. All right. Anyway. And so so I, I think not I'm not necessarily wrapping up because there's more things that we're going to do. Um, but again, the topic, if if you choose to use this as like your platform, right, as, as your starting point, if you don't have to, like I said. I was about to make that joke again, wasn't I? Anyway, um, but if you do, if you do, then uh, make sure your topic is something, an event or a decision, something that happened in time, okay? Literally, like I can pinpoint, a uh, quick example, Pearl Harbor, okay? Okay, why did the Americans enter into the Second World War? Okay, what were the events that led up? In, see what I mean? Like we're looking for something specific rather than an overall theory. Oh, okay, so so I'm, my, my causal analysis will be war. No, you can't, that won't work, that won't work. But a given war, yes, that would work. Maybe even better, rather than a given war, maybe a given battle, like something specific, right? And again, like I'm just throwing these things off the top of my head. Okay, now what I wanna do is let's just take a look at uh, some templates for thesis statements. Remember last lecture, we were talking a bit about the thesis. If you were to do a causal analysis, all right, or actually this will apply to any argument, right? Basically, there's a few things you wanna be aware of, okay? <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. So the first thing, notice it's bolded, limit your topic. You've only got what, four to five pages? Again, for your final research take home, okay? Four to five pages, limit your topic. That's what, that's what I meant just a second ago. And I said, well, war, no. Second World War, maybe. Something that specifically happened in the Second World War. Now we're getting more specific, right? So there you go. And then maybe you might have a template for a thesis that looks something like this. The causes of S were A, B, and C. So A, B, and C, when we start talking more about structure, right? Well, remember we talked a bit about the 15 steps, right? So the A, B, and C would be your areas, the areas you're gonna work through. S would be the, the subject itself, right? But that's not necessarily the best thesis that we can come up with. Because if you think about it, a, th a thesis like that, so that's why I say it's a template for a thesis, the causes of S were A, B, and C. Now the problem with that, and by the way, and that, that is a typical uh, thesis statement that, you, that I'll find in first year university papers. Can you see the problem with a thesis like that? Basically, okay, well, if we were to say the causes of S being the, the event or the decision were A, B, and C, well, couldn't I just list A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K? So you want to start playing around then with language. Maybe you would say instead the major causes of S were A, B, and C, right? So notice now how you're adding an argumentative tone. Okay, to your paper, that would be better. So the example I have here, it's it's not the best, but there was there was talk at one time that that maybe the Ottawa senators would leave the city. Okay, that they they would be relocated. This goes this goes way back. The owner back then was a guy named Rod Bright. Okay, so we're not talking about today. So the consequences of a city losing its professional sports team would be a decline in small business sales, a loss of outside financial investment. Okay, for the community and the demise of sport culture in the city. So boom, 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 right? The areas we will work through. So that's how then the introduction, which I still haven't really, I haven't given you everything on that yet, but now we begin to see how we can build an introduction, right, right? So not only then do we have, and, and again, I could have made that stronger. We could have said the, 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 the major consequences by adding that one word, as I said, gives it a more argumentative tone, okay? So think about that too. And I, again, we're gonna do much more with that. We're still only in the first half of the course. We haven't even really gotten yet to the whole research paper itself. We're gonna do lots with that, all right? And so 
basically then you could write a paper like that, you know, based on markets from, or based on data from other markets or what have you, all right? But then, as I said, you want to be careful. So this, this is the reason why I gave that, that specific example. You always want to be careful if you choose to do a causal analysis, especially if you're choosing to do the effects of something, watch out for speculation. You don't want to speculate. And you may want to email me now saying, well, well I, I don't understand. Okay, well, let's step back a second. Don't speculate. There is a way that you can still argue things without speculating, but it's a fine balance. So once again, my advice, if you want to do a, a causal analysis, do the reasons for, the reasons for what, what led up to, okay, the event or the decision. And that way you'll avoid speculation. Okay, so no email on that, right? You follow what I'm saying there? If you're unsure, chances are you want to do the reasons that led up to something rather than the effects. Okay, or the consequences of. And so, as I said at the very bottom of the page then, when you have the, the, the reasons for S were A, B, and C, at the very bottom then, okay, by adding the major factors that led to X were A, B, and C, it just makes the paper more argumentative. That's all, that's all. So keep that in mind too, okay? Yeah. And then, as I said, now we begin to see how everything starts to work together, okay? And so, I could write it that way. I could write, you know, the, the, the reasons for whatever were A, B, and C, or, I, and I can do it all in one sentence. This is another thing about the thesis statement. We each have our own styles, right? So I'm not asking that you don't have to do it one way, but remember what I did mention about how the thesis statement for your final research paper should be in the last sentence of your introduction, okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to combine the thesis statement with the areas. And so let's just take a look at the top of page three to see what I mean by that. The above factors, and so that would have been A, B, and C, right, you, which you already listed, right, were the most significant, okay, in the destruction, development, whatever, of X. Notice how general I'm being there. You can just plug in your own topics, follow along, boom, there's your thesis, okay? So, so as I said, you can either combine them, as some people like to do, or separate them as I like to do. I, I prefer to have my sections all laid out and then make that final thesis statement, okay? But remember... Do not, do not put your thesis statement in the, as your first sentence in your introduction. Don't, don't do that. Just not very good for style. All right. And so, um, and there you go. Right. And so notice what I have in bolded there. Okay. I, I'm repeating myself now. I found that doing the causes leading up to the event, event or decision usually work better than the effects. So, and, I, and again, you don't have to email saying, well, do we have, no, it's up to you. It's up to you. I'm just giving you advice, okay? I'm just giving you some tips to think, all right, this just my experience. I've noticed that the papers that papers that deal with the reasons leading up to something, the causes leading up to something, they're, they're just, as I said, they're just more factual, okay? Like it's easy to find facts rather than speculation. Okay, that's it. That's the only reason why I'm saying that. So last couple of things then, all right? Um, well, actually, the examples I gave, it's amazing because I've done this lecture so many times, but the example I have there, yeah, the, the causes leading up to a certain war, and then there is my example on feminism, right? Not going to work. Not going to work. And so there you go. What I find, and you can have a bit of fun with this, if, if on your final research paper you really don't know, you know, I just don't know what I want to write about or whatever, well, you could actually write about uh, an invention. What led to, you know, a certain invention? or a medical breakthrough. So those topics work really well. And, and again, there, but there's hundreds of others, but those ones do work, okay? So uh, if, you know, if, if you're unsure, whatever, um, yeah, maybe an invention or a medical cure, medical breakthrough, whatever. As I said, it's, it's interesting. Let me give you, okay, let me give you one, um, and you, you'll be surprised. I'm not gonna elaborate, but if you're interested, go take a look. The birth control pill for women you'd be amazed to look at the history of how that came about. And it wasn't intended for women. That's all I'll say. So as I said, when we start, when we start to look into these things, right, then we, we, basically it goes back to what the Greeks used to call rhetoric, right? Uh, rhetoric meant at one time, it meant being, being able to argue both sides. And so quite often I find in a first year paper, 
because I say this quite often, quite often we're way too close to our material, right? If, if, there's, a, so if there's an issue that we feel strongly about, quite often in class, like I would say to a student, like I can tell you're way too close to this material. Why not take the opposite view? And it's amazing how all of a sudden, you know, how, 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 how objective the paper becomes. So watch out for that too. That's going back to what I was talking about with your initial biases and prejudices. Especially, I can't, oh, I, I, I can't stress this enough. If you are a strong environmentalist, do not write on that for your final research paper. I'm just warning you right now. Because what happens is, and again, we'll talk more about this, you start to take things for granted. You start to use language that could almost be insulting. So watch out for that, okay? But anyway, again, like I can't force you to, you know, whatever topics you want to do, but just be aware. Just be careful. All right. Now, so as I said, that was only a, a, a little introduction into causal analysis. Like I said, you do not have to use that for your final paper. I just thought it was one way, you know, we took a half hour just to talk about, well, there's a different way that you could actually write a paper. All right. And I mean, the, the course is called Workshop in Essay Writing. So and I, I, I'm going to give you at least two more, two more different models or, or methods, right? Argument, comparative analysis, right? And I'm sure I'll talk about other things as well as we move along. All right. Now, the next thing we want to do then, you might want to take a little pause here, um, but we're, we're going to just talk a tiny bit about comma splices. Okay, what is a comma splice? Now, this is going to go back to something that we talked about in Lecture 3. What was the first word that I mentioned in Lecture 3? There's a word I wanted to define. The word was clause. Okay, so do you remember what a clause is? A clause is simply a group of words. What I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so, may, maybe 15, although I think it's only going to be about 10, what I'm going to talk about actually goes back to all of the different rules that we talked about with commas. Remember how I showed you there were four that you really needed to know, and, and they're so simple if you just follow those four, but then it was rule number five that, that, that just screws everyone up, right? Where you start having those introductory words or phrases in the middle of sentences. Remember all that? So let's keep that in mind as I start to do comma splices. And so, again, some of you, again, will be confused. You'll be confused. But if you follow those rules that I gave you and you get your introductory words at the beginning of your sentences, okay, you won't fall into this pattern. So let's look at a comma splice. Remember the word clause, group of words, not a, not a full sentence, just a group of words. Comma splices are grammatical errors that join two complete sentences with a comma. So how, how could I say that a bit differently? You cannot connect two independent clauses with a comma. You can't have an independent clause, remember, a full sent a proper sentence, then a comma, then another independent clause. You can't, okay, that it's just incorrect style. So, okay, let me give you an example. Joey went to the grocery store, then I then I put a comma. He needed to buy eggs for supper. Okay, that is incorrect. Why? Well, in the first clause, okay, Joey went to the grocery store. That's a full sentence. That is, that's an independent clause. We have our subject, Joey. What did Joey do? He went. Okay. Where doesn't matter, right? That's what we call the object, but, but don't worry about that. So Joey went. Okay. And then we have our object. Well, boom, that's a sentence. You cannot put a comma there and then put, he needed to buy eggs for supper. Because once again, he is a subject. Needed is the verb. So the, when we write like that, these are the kind of things, if you recall, when I was talking about the 15 steps, remember that? Remember in step 14, 13 or 14, I said, leave it alone. Okay, go away. Like, go do something else. This is exactly the kind of thing you would never catch. Okay, I shouldn't say that, but rarely. You would not, you would rarely catch a problem like that because as you wrote it and as it came out of your head, it sounded nice and smooth. That's the kind of thing that someone else might catch. Okay. But if you've been editing and editing and editing, you're not going to catch something like that. So, uh, so I, again, that's why I said, ask someone else, ask someone else to just take a quick look at your paper. All right. I can give you, 
lots more hints on editing, which I will later on. Okay, we don't want to do too much, right? Your midterm is coming up. I realize that. All right. Okay. So here is your, I wouldn't call it a rule, but something to remember. A comma alone cannot join two complete sentences. You can't do that. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, could I put a semicolon there? Yeah, I guess you could, but do you want to improve your writing, right? So there's other ways that we can fix these things. All right. So you could write instead, um, or no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So if we remember back then to lecture three, okay? Matter of fact, yeah, I have to make a note of that. Okay, I had lecture two, but I changed things up for the summer, okay, or sorry, for this course. So these things are, as I said, are known as independent clauses, right? So the question becomes then, how do I catch a comma splice, all right? Basically, you wanna look, look, examine the commas that you use in your writing, okay? If they fall into the four patterns that I showed you okay, when we were doing grammar, then you should be fine. But when you fall into that fifth category, that's where you'll find comma splices, okay? You may find comma splices. And so compare, okay, your clauses, okay? The groups of words in your sentences, okay? Compare especially when you have a comma that separates a longer sentence, take a look and see. Is it actually one sentence or is it two different sentences? Okay. If they can act as complete sentences on their own, then you've caught a comma splice. That, that's how it works. All right. Now, how can we fix comma splices? Easy. There's, there's four or five different ways that we can do it. We could separate okay, the, um, the two clauses into two sentences and replace the comma with a period. You can do that. Right. Remember the example I gave before, like Terry plays hockey. Terry played, remember all that? So you could do it that. That's one way to do it. So here, Joey went to the grocery store, period. He needed to buy eggs for supper. But now, going back to what I said about Terry, right? Terry plays basketball. Terry plays football. That's still, if you read it, let's just read it again, right? Joey went to the grocery store, period. He needed to buy eggs for supper, period. So it's a bit choppy. Would you agree, right? A bit choppy. And quite... Quite a few of first year writers, they, they tend to have choppy writing. All right. So how about, let's just do this instead, okay? There's like, you wanna start thinking now about the flow to your writing. So that is where, remember, remember the word conjunction, remember we, okay, but don't worry about it. There's certain connecting words, connecting words, right? We'll talk more about this when we get into uh, coordinating and, and, and subordinating clauses, right? Sounds complicated, it's not. I'll, I'll, give you lots of tricks, but it's words like, just take a look at the words I've, I've included for you, and, but, or, for, right? All these, all these words that can actually connect ideas. But now let me give you an even better one for Joey, all right? Joey went to the grocery store because he needed to buy eggs for supper. So now, isn't that much better than having the two independent clauses, right? So lots of different ways that we can play around with language. But the one word, the one word, if, if you find in your writing, if you've ever been told that your writing tends to be just a bit choppy, use the word and. And will make connections for you as long as you as long as you use it correctly. All right. What I mean by that is every once in a while, someone will use and instead of but or but instead of and. You don't want to do that. Those two words mean very different things, right? One is a continuation, and but as I've already shown you you shift. But if you use words like that, right, it does make your writing, it, it, it makes your writing flow better. Okay, so keep it in mind, keep that in mind. Now, uh, yeah, so if you go back, yeah, we were talking about that with conjunctions as well. And I said, don't worry about it. But it is words like but yet words like that. So there will be times there might be times where you will need a comma before that that connecting word. But then there'll be other times where you don't. So, of course, if you're using the word but, okay, obviously, remember the rule I gave you, you would need it. If you're using and, well, no, you probably wouldn't need it. Rarely, this is an interesting point in grammar as well. Rarely do you need a comma before the word and in a sentence. Rarely, okay? It, it, yes, it is true that it'll come up. 
and again, I'll show you that later on. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But if you if you do use something like a, a subordinate conjunction or, or a subordinate clause, and again, we haven't talked about that yet. Again, I'm anticipating. I don't want people who really know their stuff, you know, emailing me. You're wrong about that. That that's, that's I get it. I get it. But there are. But there rarely, rarely do you want to have a comma before the word and. There's there's another really good rule right there. It's not even a, like I just made that up, right? But just rarely would you have a comma before the word and. Okay. Now, um, I think we've only got a couple more things to do. Then we'll talk about your midterm, right? Thirty-five minutes. I figured it's going to be about forty-five minutes today. So finally then, um, yeah. So Joey went to the grocery store, comma, but he forgot to buy eggs for supper. So you see how you can play around with all this stuff, right? Or you could have easily written instead, Joey went to the grocery store and he bought eggs for supper. So in that case, you wouldn't need the comma. Good, all right. So now here's a quick reminder then from lecture three, all right? The problem with words like however. So I want to return to that just so we clean this stuff up in our writing. All right. Okay. Let's just say, I, ha, look at your notes now. Okay. We're at the bottom of page four. The major corporations, however, do not agree. That's the example that I have there. Okay. That's fine. That, that rule number five, the introductory words or phrases, but in rule number five, it works here, okay? That's, that's how we have phrases for those words in the middle of sentences. So my point being, you can do it. You can do it as long as you know how to do it, right? If you don't know how to do it, then just don't. Go back and use rule number four, have those words at the beginning, okay? Followed by a comma. But as I said, but you can do it if you just know what you're doing. So, the rule works. If you have the, this next sentence, okay? Justin is a great chef, comma. However, his apartment is a mess. No, doesn't work. Doesn't work. So, in that example, we have what we call a comma splice. That's a comma splice, okay? And so even though, even though the two sentences look the same, they're not, they're not. And so in the second example, right, there's a couple of things, okay, that you, you, you could do, okay? In the second example, right, we have two independent clauses. Justin is a great chef, his apartment is a mess. Those stand on their own. So therefore, they have to be separated or joined in the proper grammatical manner. I know this stuff is complicated. You're thinking, I have, I, I don't have a clue what he's talking about right now. Don't worry about it. Get those introductory words or phrase at the beginning. Whenever you're using them, make sure they're the first words in the sentence. Then put the comma, then go ahead and write whatever it is you're gonna write. So, two ways that we can fix the problem here, okay? Because it all goes back to the comma, right? Justin is a great chef, comma, but his apartment is a mess. That's fine, that's fine. Now, interestingly enough, we fix the comma rules, okay? We fix the comma splice, I should say, with which rule? Number one, we went back to number one, okay? Comma before the word but in the middle of a sentence, that's it. Or, Justin is a great chef and his apartment is beautiful. So in that case, we did not need a comma, right? And being the connecting word, working the way that it does, does not need, need any punctuation. So again, these are the kind of things you want to practice just a bit, right? Just to remind yourself, okay, sometimes I need it, sometimes I don't. It depends on which, whichever word I choose, okay? Okay? All right. But as I said, but it can get more complicated, especially when we start thinking about words like although, okay? So as I said, let's hold off on that. Let's not worry too much about that just yet. All right. Okay. So, so as I said then, so today, so far, we've looked at causal analysis, which you may or may not utilize in your, in your final paper. And you know what joke I'm going to make there, but I won't, but you may or may not. Okay. I won't. All right. And then we looked at uh, comma splices. 
So if you think about it now, we've looked at the comma, usage comma, the usage of the comma. We've looked at a bit of style. Now we've looked at comma splices. The, the word, by the way, that you might have seen in your own writing in high school, your, your teachers might have said things like frag, right? Fragment, right? That's the kind of stuff we're trying to fix here. All right. So as I said, final rule, and then we'll take about 10 minutes to look over your midterm. Um, final rule. It's very similar, okay, to what we talked about. I'm trying to remember now. There was a connection I was going to make there. Oh, and, and so as, as I keep telling you, right, try not to overthink these things, all right? Try not to overthink them. Just follow the four rules that we talked about with the comma, because if you are still a bit confused about rule number five, you can simply eliminate it easily by putting those words or phrases at the beginning. And that's about it. That's about it. Okay, okay. So now let's talk about your midterm, all right? And the midterm, it's very straightforward, very straightforward. By now, you've already done a summary, okay? Well, basically, the midterm will be almost identical. You'll be doing a summary once again. So again, I'll be sending an article, and you'll be asked to summarize it. So much of what we've already talked about in Lecture 2 will apply. But there's a couple of small things that, I shouldn't say small things, but there are a few other things that, that we should we should talk about. So um, you'll be given two hours. Remember, I talked about that in the very first lecture. I wasn't sure. I decided I may as well just give you the two hours, right? That should be plenty of time, plenty of time. But remember, but, but, the, the, but the department has asked us to have a timed lecture, okay? I'm oh, sorry, a timed exam. So that uh, that's not up to me. But I just thought I'll give you more time. That way you should be okay. So I'll send it at a specific time. And again, I'll email you before. Like I'll, I'll make sure a couple of days earlier, I'll say, be prepared. I'll be sending the email at this time, what have you. All right. And um, it's off. It's off. I would love it if, if it was an open book, right? You may not use any. How in the world would I be able to police something like that, right? But the, the nice thing about it is the exams for this course anyway, like before the changes were made, they're all open book anyway. Like you're always allowed to bring whatever you want to the exam. So that doesn't affect us at all. I might have mentioned that in the first lecture. Maybe not. Okay. Sorry, for some reason, I've got something in my throat. Hmm. That's better. Okay. So, uh, so you'll get two hours. And it'll be more or less summary, except there'll be a couple of things on the next page. Don't worry, you'll know exactly when, when, when time comes. So the exam is mandatory, obviously, right? And uh, is worth 20% of your grade, okay? All right, please, as always, once you've done your exam, send it back as a word attachment, okay? PDFs, sometimes you can manipulate them, but I, 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 words, word attachments are so much easier to manipulate, I find. So send back as a word attachment, remember, it will not be on Brightspace. I'm going to directly send it to your U Ottawa account. But we've talked about that, haven't we? Like, by, at least by now, we should know that. I probably sent angry email to a couple of you saying, please, from now on. All right. Anyway. Um, and then you can use anything you want with you. Again, though, again, let's not oversimplify this. Okay. You don't, I'm not, I'm not asking you to do any research. Okay. There's, there is something I am going to ask of you. And we'll see that on the next page. But I'm not asking you, don't go do a whole lot of research before I send it, okay? Like, like there's just no point. There's no point, all right? So the goal of the midterm is to demonstrate critical reading, which we've been talking about, paraphrasing, and then summarizing skills, okay? And, uh, and oh, that's the, that's the big thing. And the proper use of citations. So give me just two seconds, like, let me just keep going and then I will clarify, all right? Okay, so you're going to, as, as we did before with our practice run through with don't blame the eater, right? And then as you did as well, and remember I, I sent out, you know, clear instructions and all of that. So we'll be doing the same thing again. It's, it's the same thing, all right? And again, not, these are not my choices. Again, these are depart departmental, uh, uh, choices that have been made for us. So you'll get two files. Okay, one will be the the essay. Sorry, the article. I don't know why I had a brain fart there. So one will have the the the, the article, 
and then there'll be just a, a sheet which is going to look almost exactly like what I'm giving you here, except, except it will simply be a bit more detailed. I'm literally going to give you hints right now. Okay, so answer the following questions. You, so in other words, you're going to read the article and remember what I said in summarizing, read it a couple of times, make some notes. But again, you see, because I'm because you have a certain time frame, right? So read it and make notes, right? Highlight, do whatever, and you know, feel free to mark it up as much as you want. You won't be sending that back, obviously, right? So then the first, what do you think the first question is going to be? Well, obviously it's going to be, what is the thesis? Okay, so you got to figure that out. Now, remember, as we talked about the thesis, you either get it or you don't. It's not like you could, don't give, don't give, you know, a half a page answer for the thesis. No, no. You want to give one sentence. Okay, that's the thesis. So let me be clear. Word for word, okay, you're literally going to write word for word. Then in question two, it's going to say something like, and again, don't email me about this. Sometimes you have to read between the lines. Part of the midterm is to, is to figure out, have you been paying attention? Have you been following what we, we've been doing? So the second question, and by the way, and so the thesis, 2%, okay? Then the next question, question will be worth 3%, okay? And like of the, the exam and your final grade, whatever. And it'll it'll be worded in such a way that it's it's kind of vague, but again, if you've been following along, you'll know exactly what I'm looking for. So what are the areas of argumentation? Okay. So and I'm not gonna say anything more than that. Again, if you've been following along, you know what I'm talking. You know, you know. Then finally you'll you'll just be given a question, okay? Summarize, like summarize the article. And of course, that will include all the stuff we talked about, right? The, you know, the, the attitude of the, arg, of, of the author and whatever, all the stuff I talked about in the lecture too, okay? And, and be, but you've gotten feedback already on that from your first major assignment, so you know what we're looking for. But then this is the interesting thing. So that's going to be worth 15%. So the way I would grade it, it you would get a, a grade out of 10 multiplied by 1.5, right? In other words, is this, a, is this an A paper, 80? Right. Well, then times 1.5 equals 12 out of 15. OK. And, and so on and so on and so on. But there's a possibility you could lose up to two marks in question three in your summary. Because if you remember, as per your first assignment, you're going to be asked to do a paraphrase and an actual quote. See, because we've now done it once, we're figuring, OK, now do we get to the midterm? You've had all the feedback. You should know how to do this. And so that's what we're looking for. So remember that 12 out of 15 you just got, right? Well, in fact, it just went down to 10 out of 15 because you missed both, both of the uh, citations. So here is my only advice for the midterm. You can't, you can't really study for something like this. No, go back to lecture two. Know how to cite and paraphrase. Remember, there was that one area where it got a bit complicated, right? This is how you paraphrase an MLA. This is how you quote an MLA. This is how you paraphrase an APA. Have that in front of you. Or, or I shouldn't even say that much. Cut and paste, whichever one you're using, have that in front of you, just so you know how to do it. But because, as I said, because by now you've had your midterm, your, sorry, your uh, assignment, first assignment, you've had the feedback and everything else, right? This should be an easy run through. So, okay, yeah, once we send the exam, don't then send an email saying, but I'm confused, how do I do this? No, no, once the exam is sent, it's sent. You've got the two hours, send it back, okay? I'll be sitting at the computer. I'll be sitting waiting. A note will come out saying, you have five minutes left to get them in. And so, again, I'm sorry, but that's not my policy. Again, it's department policy, all right? And they are strict on stuff like that. So uh, in your exam, and please make a note of this because these are the kind of questions that I get all the time. Don't worry about footing, footers, headers, any of that kind of stuff, title page. You know, just make sure your information is on your exam. All right. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've had students send papers and they didn't have their name or well, like make sure at least that information is on your exam. OK, we're just looking to see have you have you have you learned the stuff that we've talked about so far. OK, so because of that. 
You will not need a works cited. You will not need a reference sheet. Okay. But again, but you'll still have to do all of the in-text stuff properly. So we're almost done for the day. The summary then will be evaluated on the basis of summaries, okay, the summarization, organization. Does your summary make sense? Or is it just a whole lot of random points? See, again, we're trying to get you off of writing that way. So it sounds backwards, but it but it, it works. It works. And then, of course, we'll, we'll have grammar, punctuation, style, and spelling. Now, we'll be sticklers on that only because, well, you've got your computer. Like, you've got grammar check. You've got spell check, right? So we will be sticklers on that. And then, finally, paraphrasing and citations. And I think I've already explained that, okay? If you did them all properly, no marks off, right? But if you had a problem with the in-text citation, and again, the reason why we want you to do that is so that you, when you write the final paper okay, and any other papers at the university, you know how to do it. Simple as that, simple as that. So the final exam then, as with everything else that you hand in, should be in Times New Roman 12, and please send us a word attachment. Now, I am going to include that information at the bottom that the article is taken from, they say, I say, but you don't need that. For some reason, though, student, some students just like to have that information. All right? Okay? And so, uh, or actually, no, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, I made a mistake there. I made a huge mistake there. You will need that information now that I think about it. Sorry about that. I, I Just forget what I said. Forget what I said. You will need that information in order to do your in-text citation. Okay? So, that is the one thing. Okay? There's one or two things. That you're gonna have to figure out. And the last thing that I just said there, you'll have to figure that out. So I'm not gonna answer any email questions. Like, what do you mean by that? Go back to lecture two where I, where I show you how to do all that. That's really the only work you have to do for, for like preparation or whatever for the midterm, okay? So sorry, okay, but forget what I said before. You will need that information. Not all of it, not all of it, but you will need some of it. I'm not gonna say anything else, all right? Okay, so anyway, uh, 50 minutes as usual, right? So that's it for the day. And then um, good luck on the midterm. And uh, like I said, I'll be, I'll be sending you an email a couple of days ahead just to remind you the time and everything else. And I think that's good for the day, all right? So uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And, oh, and obviously there will not be a video uh, in week six or whatever number it is because we're doing the midterm, all right? So then once the midterm is done and you, you know, you, whatever, then we'll start to get into the final research paper, okay, the take home. And I don't think there's anything else I need to clarify. But as I said, there, there might be one or two things that, that do come up. So I'll, I will send a detailed email to all of you, just letting you know, okay, be aware, be prepared, like get, uh, whatever, whatever, you know what I mean. All right, again, I'm talking too long. Goodbye. <laughs>